What's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of The Arnie's, and today we have a special bonus podcast for you, and we're happy to introduce the podcast within a podcast. It's the boys talking the boys. And so, <laughs> what this, I guess, weekly uh, bonus podcast is just going to be me, Austin, and Keith a little bit later on once he gets caught up. We're just going to be talking about the boys as each episode comes out. So season two premiered last week. They dropped three episodes at once. And uh, for the next, I believe, five weeks, they're going to drop one episode. So you can expect until this season's done, little bonus episodes for you. Just kind of running down our thoughts on the season thus far. So, of course, before we hop right in, I got my buddy. Well, hold on. Gosh, I'm so unused to being the host, I forgot to introduce myself. <laughs> so, I'll be your host for this mini-series. It's me, Matt, and I'm with me, as always, we got Austin. Austin, how are you? I'm good. I guess you could say the boys are back in town. The boys are certainly back in town. Um, yeah, so you know what? We're not going to really try and focus on hitting an hour like we usually do. We're just going to hop right in, and if it's shorter, then there you go. You can listen to it quicker. So let's get right into it. So Austin, before we hop right in, I'm curious. You know, the boys kind of, I guess, a little over a year ago or whenever it was, whenever season one premiered, it really kind of took people by storm. It certainly got Amazon Prime, like people to sign up and watch the show that everybody was talking about. So I'm curious for you, what are some of your quick thoughts whenever you finally got around to watching season one? Yeah, I really enjoyed season one. Um, that one definitely sucked me in. I think I finished it in like a weekend, as did most of the world. Um, I think it's a really interesting take on the superhero world. Um, if you look at like our real world, we really only see superheroes as these like all good people all the time. And I think uh, if heroes did exist in the real world, the more likely scenario is something like this, where uh, big money gets involved and then our heroes are actually end up being like greedy little bastards. So um, I really enjoyed the show. I really like that they're willing to go dark and really buy into the world that they're playing in. Yeah, these superheroes are essentially just a parody of the Justice League. And for all intents and purposes, for the public, they are what you just said. They are all good all the time. But whenever you get into their personal lives and what they do when they're not on camera or in front of people, that's when we start to realize that absolute power corrupts absolutely. And these people are, for the most part, all garbage people. And even the ones that have redeeming qualities certainly have done a lot of bad shit along the way. So yeah, I'm right there with you. Before we get any further, let's just say, everybody, uh, we are going to be entering spoiler territory here. So if you haven't seen the first three episodes of season two or season one, we'll probably spoil something here. So go watch all that and then come back and you can do enjoy this episode along with us. Yeah, absolutely. Spoilers, spoilers, spoilers. This whole series, we're not going to really um, try and avoid those. So just be aware of that if you haven't watched the episode that we're talking about. We'll make sure to put the titles in the description so you're not confused. But this one will be easy because they dropped three at once, so there should be no confusion there. Uh, but yeah, uh, just speaking on season one real quick, I'm right there with you. I really loved it. I think, like you, I probably watch it in a weekend as well. Um, certainly interesting to note that season one, they dropped all the episodes at once. And like we said, this one, they've dropped a few at the beginning, but now going forward, it's going to be weekly. So I think we'll have a little bit more time to kind of digest it, digest it. And the series itself might stay with us for a bit longer, but, um, just in terms of thoughts, I really enjoyed it. I echo everything you said. I thought the performances were fantastic. I thought the storyline was really interesting. I thought at first it was going to just going to be kind of like a show that, had a lot of gore for the sake of gore and just like, oh, cool, it's in the superhero genre. But actually, once I started to get a few more episodes in, I realized there is some depth here and they really play around with the politics of it, what these people would be like in real life, what the public reaction to it is, and kind of how they sort of act as pawns in this big game. So it really became a lot more um, interesting than I expected. And season one um, ended with I guess you could call him the main character, kind of. Carl Urban's character, Billy Butcher, finds out that um, turns out his wife wasn't dead. Uh, Homelander takes him to where his wife is, who he thought was dead this whole time, and turns out not only is she alive, but she is living with a son that is not Billy Butcher's. It is our main villain, Homelander's kid. Um, and that is kind of our season one cliffhanger finale. And so I think with that, we can get right into season two. Austin, before we get in, did you have any thoughts on that big finale? I thought it was a really good twist that I did not see coming, because the whole, the whole, uh, the entirety of season one, you think, uh, Billy Butcher's wife has been assaulted by Homelander and killed. And it turns out she actually had an affair and ended up getting pregnant. Um, so I'm really interested to see 
that conversation between Butcher and Becca whenever we get there. I'm curious what that's going to look like. And I'm curious if Butcher has already put two and two together or if he still thinks she was assaulted by Homelander. Yeah, I guess I don't fully remember, but I do remember, you are right, I do remember that there was some kind of suspicion that it could have been actually consensual, but certainly there's storm. There's still more in store as the season goes on, so we'll figure it out. And it's funny that you said that this show ended up being like a little different than what you originally expected, because I actually went into this show originally thinking it was a comedy, and it's really not. It has it definitely has some funny moments, but it's not, I, I would definitely not classify this as a comedy. So that took me like... I got used to it really quickly, but it was definitely as we get in as you get into the show, it's definitely very different than I think how they marketed it and at least how I perceived it going into it. Sam, I think it was it took me a few episodes to really get into it, but it was definitely the moment in I believe episode one where the deep um ends up sexually assaulting Starlight. It, up until that point I thought it was just gonna be a fun show, but when that happened I was like, Oh, okay, it's definitely not gonna be. So yeah, that was kind of the first moment for me. But anyway, um, I figured even though this is season two, it might be fun to talk about the cast because some of them are kind of big names, but some of them are a bit smaller. So I wanted to definitely shine some light on some of these. So also, why don't you take us off with the big one, like we already mentioned. What do you think of Carl Urban as Billy Butcher, both in season one? And how do you feel about him so far in season two before we get into kind of the, the plot details? I think he makes this show. I love his performance in this show. I think this is other than Judge Dredd, I think this is probably the best role I've seen Carl Urban in. But yeah, I think he makes a show. I couldn't imagine this show without him. And um, his just his version of Billy Butcher is so great. And we kind of talked about this offline, but it it literally is just Carl Urban playing himself, just with more swearing. And I think he's yeah. the perfect person for this role. I completely agree. And then, of course, I think the other huge one we got to talk about um, is kind of, I guess, Billy Butcher's arch nemesis, you might say, Anthony Starr, who I had never seen in, I don't think, anything really before I saw The Boys Season 1, but he plays Homelander, and um, he's basically just a fucked up version of Superman. He, in person and on cameras, he kind of is Superman. He is that kind of um, Americana representation. He's this really goody two-shoes, almost a Boy Scout seemingly doing good just for the sake of doing good, and it's the right thing to do. And he wants the world to all be united and superheroes can help make that happen. He's all, you know, gung-ho for that. But behind the scenes, uh, not so good. He is a genocidal murderer. He is in favor of creating domestic terrorists just for the sake of having superheroes have supervillains so that they can exist. Um, like we already said, he, he murders just for the sake of it. I think he thinks it's fun. Um, and he could be a rapist as well. So this guy is terrible. And I just think the performance here is pretty amazing, to be frank. I think it's one of like the best villains I've seen in quite a long time. What are your thoughts on Homelander? Yeah, I had never seen Anthony Starr before the show either. And um, just like Carl Urban, I think he's perfect in the role. Um, the way he goes from like charming to the public eye to just a maniac behind the scenes is like just the way he flips that switch in his performance is incredible. And I really could not imagine another person playing this role and it's funny that you say that he's like the fucked up version of superman because i think superman is supposed to embody like the good qualities of humanity and i think homelander really em embodies the terrible qualities of like corporate america so they definitely have yeah. their uh their different uh character attributes for sure for sure i don't think it's any like big revelatory thing but i think superman um became who he was because of where his ship landed. You know, go back and listen to our first episode on Man of Steel. I mean, he became who he was because he landed on the Kent farm. Homelander, I don't exactly, I mean, he was created and he was a test subject for his entire life. That's what he was. So it's kind of like a nature versus nurture thing. You can make the argument if Homelander had the same upbringing as Superman, maybe we would have seen a better guy, but it's kind of interesting where his background led him. And I think it's no secret that's that was done on purpose it's kind of like a superman red sun type thing yeah i was i was gonna say because um dc has tried to do that with superman red sun but uh spoilers for red sun like superman still ends up being good in that alternate universe too so it's just really a testament to super superman's character that no matter where he lands he always finds a way to end up being the good guy yeah and I, I completely agree. So I don't want to do everybody, but I'm just going to kind of run down a few more cast members. And uh, if you, there's one that jumps out at you, just let me know. So another of our kind of main characters is we have Jack Quaid, who plays Huey Campbell, who's kind of like the outside member of the boys in season one. His girlfriend is killed by A-Train, who's kind of like the 
parody, if you want to say, of The Flash. And he kind of finds his way into Billy Butcher's life and the boys' lives. We also have Aaron Moriarty, who plays Starlight, who is a new member of the Seven, who quickly finds out that things may not be as good as she was expecting. And she kind of, as the show goes on, she kind of develops a relationship with Huey, and she might end up, we'll see, becoming almost like a spy for the boys within the Seven. Um, We have Laz Alonso, who plays Mother's Milk, member of the boys. Chase Crawford, who plays The Deep. Um, We have lots of people here. We had Elizabeth Shue, who played Madeline Stilwell in season one. And then in season two, we have Giancarlo Esposito. So yeah, anybody in there or just any of the other cast members you want to highlight before we jump into the plot of season two so far? Yeah, the, the other two that I want to mention is just uh, Tomer Capon as Frenchie. Um, mm. Also just think perfect for the role. And then uh, Karen Fukurara from Suicide Squad was her debut, but she plays Kimiko in oh, the right. show as well. That's right. Yeah, I really liked her. And there was also actually um, some really fun, like smaller or i guess not smaller but just like a recurring parts like simon Pegg played huey's dad in season one i don't know if we're going to be seeing him again jennifer esposito played susan rayner who was like a cia connection in season one and she had a pretty quick guest appearance <laughs> in season two that we'll get to um like we said giancarlo esposito was literally just in one episode like barely of season one but he's been set up to be like the leader of vaught now in season I've, two i love him too in season two he's like he's perfect <laughs> And then we also had Haley Joel Osment, who played like an ex superhero, and we talked about it in our previous episode, but a former child star who can read minds. I had forgotten this about him, but yeah, he is. Yeah, in this. I think he had like a multi episode appearance. But he did. His life did not uh, end so well. I believe at Butcher, I think, like murdered him by bashing his head against the sink. Well, he uh, he had turned in the boys to Homelander as well and i remember that was the first moment in season one where i was like i don't know if i can root for butcher fully, but <laughs> i do but i do 100 percent believe that's on purpose um but kind of interesting so since it's a huge cast so the cast is incredible i don't want to spend too much time on it just because we could we have plenty more episodes to get into some of these um supporting parts so let's just get into it let's break down season two so austin i'm just going to kind of run through kind of the highlights here um feel free to stop me at any point if you want to talk about it whenever we get through it um, we can break it down a bit more. And just so everybody knows, um, for these first three episodes as they came out at once, we're just going to kind of treat this discussion as one big episode. But then for the remaining episodes of the season, we'll spend a bit more time on the plot since we'll have like only an hour to go off of each week. So this time we're just going to kind of keep it a bit shorter just so we can kind of get to it since there's a lot to go off here. I kind of want to give you my uh, initial impressions of season two before we get into the highlights. Because uh, right, for, for me, season two is weird. Um, mm, okay. I still, I still really like it. I'm really happy to be back in this world. There's no doubt in my mind it's a good show, and I'm, I can't wait to see where the season goes. However, it, it still feels like they're trying to sell me on the show still almost, and I'm already mm-hmm. sold. Like episodes one and two just have a little bit too much setup for me, and like 90 percent of season one was set up, which makes sense because they're world building and they're establishing like the rules for this universe and everything. Um, so in season two, I really kind of just wanted to dive back in, but I don't think we really yeah. get to do that until episode three, um, which me- I get why they released all three at once, because I think if they had just put out episode one, every- yeah, I think people would have, I think people would have checked out, but I think since I you can get up agree. to season three or get up to episode three, um, now that we're like rolling, I'm back in, but episodes one and two, I was like a little iffy, like how much time are we going to spend here setting stuff up before the season actually gets moving? Yeah. And to that point, like we already set up, it's a huge ensemble cast. That being said, I think the show can work without Butcher if he was ever to die. That being said, it was weird that like he isn't entered. He's like the cliffhanger of the episode of season two, episode one, like his return is the big final moment. It's weird, though, that nothing else really seems to happen in the meantime. I mean, Huey's kind of leading the team. He and Starlight are trying to get the Compound V so that they can release it to the world. And they do end up doing that. But it does just feel like it kind of moves really slowly in that first episode. And I think you're right. Like, if they had just dropped that one, I don't think people would have been loving it. Um, But let's get to that real quick. Let's just get to some of the highlights. So the boys are wanted. They've been framed for Stillwell's murder. 
Um, which is kind of funny because they act like, oh, that's so messed up. Homelander was the one that did that. And then I'm like, well, I mean, that's <laughs> true. But Butcher did blow up the entire house and almost killed the baby, which <laughs> did you laugh like I did whenever they had that throwaway line where they were like, and Madeline Stilwell's baby was found on a front lawn 70 miles away. And yeah. I was like, okay. <laughs> I guess Homelander saved the baby. That's resolved. Butcher, would, <laughs> Butcher was willing to kill it. So yeah. that, that should be noted. <laughs> a point against Butcher. Strike one. Or I guess strike two if you count him brutally murdering our precious Haley Joel Osment. Well, just uh, <laughs> speaking of that really quick, I they set it up like you're supposed to like Huey more than Bitcher. But I, yeah. And I do like Huey's character. But I most of the time I just find myself wishing he would just shut up and get on board with Butcher. Because I know you're not supposed to, but I still do like Butcher way more than I like Huey. How do you feel about the two of them? I don't even know. If, well, I mean, as a person, I like Huey more. But as a character, I see what you're saying. Um, and to that point, while I don't even know if that's the argument that needs to be made, I will echo what you said earlier. It is weird that in season two, we're still doing the whole, is Huey on board with Butcher thing? Like, that's all yeah. what episode two is. It's like that, that episode ends, like the big thing at the end is like, Huey's finally on board. And it's like, oh, okay, I thought we were past that. And Huey's also already murdered some people in the first season. So he should already yeah. be on board at this point. Like, he, his hands are not yeah. clean. So he, he, he blew up, I believe, uh, translucent. <laughs> After yeah, sticking a right. bomb up his ass, if I remember correctly. <laughs> Yeah, I think French did that part, but he certainly was happy to pull the trigger. <laughs> Let's just keep it simple. The boys are wanted for murder. They're kind of hiding out. Butcher's just nowhere to be seen. In the meantime, Huey is working with Starlight because they want to extort Vought because they're trying to get a sample of this Compound V, which in season one they revealed was actually being used to manufacture superheroes. They're not born, so nobody's born special. They're just created. And I, I do like... That compound V gets exposed early in this season. Because I did not want yeah. this whole season to be, are they going to expose compound B? Is Homelander going to catch them before they can expose it? I'm glad that it's out. And I'm also kind of glad that now that it is out, that there is conflict between Vought and the Seven. Like, I I could see them, like, mm -hmm. almost separating later on in this yeah, season. I, I think we're I headed that way. And I, that. I think that's really interesting. So I'm glad they did that, like, really quickly in this in this season. Yeah, and exactly to your point, in, in episode one, there's two big things to mention in support of what you just said. One is that Stan Edgar, played by Giancarlo Esposito, is not Madeline Stilwell from season one. He he thinks the, the, the seven are basically a product. He thinks that Compound V is what shareholders care about with the bot. Seven's cool. Like, they'll make me money, but Homelander threatens to leave, and he's basically like, I don't care if you do. Like, Compound V is what's important. So, and then the other big thing that happens is Stormlander, who is Translucent's replacement. Stormfront. So Seven. Oh, Stormlander. Ooh, I, I might be shipping them. <laughs> we might get together. Uh, no, but you're right. Yeah, the character's name is Stormfront. Um, she's replacing Translucent, Translucent, and she comes in, and right off the bat, she is not a fan of Vought, and she is very outspoken. She's saying it in public. So I think those two scenes from the first episode already are kind of supporting a future. Somehow the Seven and Vought might split, and what could that mean? And I do love the moment where that uh, Daredevil-esque character is auditioning for oh, the Seven, and the Homelander yeah. just is pretends to be really impressed, and then just snaps his eardrums, and he's like, "Yeah, you're not, you're not going to be in the Seven. <laughs> yeah, it was that was like the big return to the uh, the boys room. Whenever that happened, I was like, "Okay, we're back." Um, so yeah, and then some other just quick things is we start to see Homelander kind of forming at first what seems to be a positive in a fucked up way, but by the end of at least episode three, it's not it's not in a great place. A relationship with his son Ryan. Um, so what are, what are your thoughts on that? He's basically trying to be what in his mind is a good dad because he didn't have one, and at the same time he's also trying to get him to you know learn to use these powers that he has. I find this storyline really interesting, and I, I want to see more of it, but I th it's weird because like, we spent the whole first season trying to find Becca, but now I almost feel like there's too much Becca in these first couple episodes. Like I was more interested in what the boys and like the rest of the seven were up to, and I, like, I, I've, I find this stuff with Homelander and his son really cool, but I don't think we need three episodes of it. I think we could have just had what we had in episode three and been good to go. Yeah, I think you're right. I, I think season one was more about the boys and at least so far it feels very like 50 50 to me like about the boys and about uh the seven um kind of splitting up their time giving them each storylines and to that point uh the deep has his own storyline and 
Um, it, which is basically he got kicked out of the seven um, kind of quietly after sexually assaulting Starlight in season one. And now he's on his own and he's join he joins what's called the Church of the Collective. And it's pretty mysterious and vague. But what we do know is that the whole point of this is to basically help him accept himself and eventually regain favor with the seven, which we don't see him regain favor with the seven by the end of episode, by the end of episode three. But we do see them at least kind of working together. So what were your thoughts on the deep storyline? Because there was just like a little um, kind of like flashes to him after he got kicked out in season one, there was like just quick scenes. Um, But this is definitely like its own storyline. So what were your thoughts on this one? Yeah, it, it's funny. It, it, it's really going to sound like I'm shitting on this season because um, I, I do still really like this season so far. But I also with the deep, um, even in season one, I didn't really find anything with him very interesting or funny um, except with that dolphin scene. I thought that was hilarious. Um, and kind of same thing here. I don't really like really anything that he does on screen. I don't find his story super interesting. I don't really care if he gets back into the seven, but I yeah. do think he has a funny moment with the whale at the end of episode, at the end of episode three. Um, so it really feels like his character is just around to have like one standalone funny moment a season. So I, I don't know if I really need his character to have an entire storyline as well. I think the problem is, and it kind of reminded me of the show, a really garbage Netflix show called 13 reasons why. Um, and the main reason is the problem with the deep um, is he's kind of irredeemable. Um, we're reminded this season he was a sexual assaulter. He, you know, assaulted a lot of people. I don't know if he raped people, but he's definitely close to it. Yeah. He's so, definitely a predator for sure. So right off the bat, and we see that in, that's kind of like his intro in season one. And so even though there's some interesting stuff here, and I think some stuff in a vacuum, if you, if you forget about that and just look at it in a vacuum, there's some interesting stuff with body acceptance here and kind of some interesting scenes in that sense. And it kind of, they, they basically say that since he was so uncomfortable with his body, he kind of forced himself onto other people. There was, it, I thought it was interesting that they at least tried to explain the motivation. But that being said, he's a pretty impossible character to root for and that's okay that we can't root for him i don't root for homelander but it is weird that to give the deep his own story which it kind of feels like they want us to root for him to get back in the seven that so that's kind of the difference for me is where it gets a little bit weird i think chase crawford gives a great performance but his whole storyline is a bit odd so i agree with you there and it was a lot of screen time and to your point about not really rooting for Homelander, Ho- Homelander is also irredeemable, but his story is just way more interesting than the Deep story. Like, I don't care mm-hmm. if the Deep learns to accept himself. I don't care if the Deep learns to get back in the Seven. Whereas with Homelander, I do care what he does with the Seven. I do care what genocidal thing he's going to do next. I do care how he's going to interact with the boys. So that, I think it's just a... I think it's just a factor of, like, who are you more interested in? And I don't think a lot of people are too interested in the Deep. Yeah, I, I am... I agree with you, but I am interested to see what they do. Like, I mean, is this guy going to get redeemed? I don't know, but I mean, we're certainly going to find out. I have a feeling he's going to end up working with the boys. Maybe. Possibly. I, I wouldn't be too surprised. Um, I guess we'll wait and see on that one. But also to that point, I am I am curious to see where this church plot goes. So I actually yeah, did find too. that interesting. But once again, I think just too much time spent with the deep here in these first three episodes. Yeah. I agree. I think the question of will the boys be working with, or sorry, will the deep be working with the boys is an interesting question to bring up. One character that will not be working with the boys is Rainer, played by Jennifer Esposito in season (laughs) one. She's introduced in one scene here. They try and get their CIA contact to help them out, and her head blows up. (laughs) So that was that was kind of a pretty shocking moment. Uh, and, and to your point of where you said Homelander busting that dude's eardrums, this is like I was like, oh yeah, we're we're back in the boys. When when this lady's head blew up out of nowhere, I was like, oh yeah, now the boys are back. <laughs> yeah, so. that's true. I guess I guess that one came first. So that actually, the whole uh, Rainer dying and then the CIA connection is kind of the last storyline I'm going to bring up, just because it's kind of the longest one we got here. So I'll just try. You might get a little um, convoluted, but just. Hear me out, everybody. So here's what happened. So Rainer's head blows up. Butcher comes back. He finds out that he's basically really needed um, by the boys. Huey isn't so happy about it. He doesn't think they need Butcher, but everybody else thinks they do. So Butcher then, the first thing he does is he arranges a deal with Mallory, the other character from season one. And the whole thing is like, there's a superpowered terrorist that just showed up. We, the boys, are going to find her 
and Mallory in exchange, you need to find out where Becca is. And that's all fine and dandy. But of and course, part, and part in the boys. Yes. Um, and then, of course, you know, the twist is that the superpower terrorist is revealed to be Kamiko's younger brother, um, who I guess has like kind of like telekinesis powers. And yeah, so that's kind of a, a crazy moment where they're going to go butchers ready to kill this kid. And then they find out that it's Kamiko's brother. And then all the rest of the boys are like, we actually get kind of a standoff between Butcher and the boys where they're like, we don't think you should kill him. And Butcher's still <laughs> wanting to kill anybody that has any type of superpower. So eventually they do end up capturing him, though. They're not going to kill him. They do capture him. Butcher basically gets this boat. All the boys, along with their new prisoner, are now aboard this boat. And they're basically just going to drive to Mallory, who's at a CIA, I guess, safe house. And once they get the terrorists there, then they're going to be all fine. The season, the show's going to be done. (laughs) They're going to be pardoned and everything's going to be good. But of course, who shows up from his own storyline, The Deep, rejoins kind of... uh, The main storyline, I guess, if you want to say, riding his whale, like Austin mentioned, and that kind of stops them for a bit. They are able to escape, and it seems like they're still going to be able to get away, but then right as they're getting close to the safe house, the rest of the seven arrives, and this is when things kind of come to a head at the end of the episode, and you get some really surprising moments, because at this point, Stormfront seems like she's almost going to be, like, she's not going to be, like, as good, I guess, if you want to call it that, like, um... Like or maybe like she's not going to be as altruistic of a character. I thought she was gonna. I thought she was gonna end up as Starlight's ally, but that's clearly exactly, she wants yeah. Homelander's spot. So I didn't see that coming, and that's actually a twist I really liked in the season. I want to learn more about Stormfront and her motivations. Um, and I also think Stormfront and Starlight have a conversation where Stormfront Stormfront basically says like, "Hey, I'm not a Vought spy. You don't have to always be like on and fake around me." And I actually think she could be a Vought spy because Vought selected her like to be into the Seven. So I was kind of worried that Stormfront was going to expose Starlight stealing the Compound V. Yeah, because she literally, she literally just shows up. Yeah. And not only does she just show up, whenever Homelander confronts Edgar about it, he's very like, I pick who's on the Seven. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. So it is kind of odd. It's like, does she have some kind of, you know, working relationship like already? I did not expect her... To be completely evil, though. So that was a twist that did surprise me. Yeah, so basically she ends up catching um, Kenji, Kimiko's brother, and not only subdues him, basically rips his hands off. I I don't know if she decapitates him, but like just like snaps his neck. Also, I won't repeat it, of course, but uses a very derogatory racial slur. It's like, oh... So, yeah, Stormfront kind of seemed like maybe she'd be a shining light, but not not looking like it. On that note of her using a very derogatory racial slur, slur it's also very weird in this, mom- this current moment in the country with all the protests and Black Lives Matter going on about <clears throat> the way police treat people of color in our society to then see the superhero take down, like, basically go through murdering an entire, like, projects-based apartment complex where... The only people that are that we see in that complex are all people of color. Yeah, and they're also It's just very jarring and very it's very weird to juxtapose that with the current moment we're seeing in the in the country, like in real life. Yeah, I completely agree. It was hard to watch. I mean, it's like not only did she kill this character, but she also basically in the process not only murders a patriarch, but it's pretty much implied that she murdered the rest of the family as the other character was trying to escape. And the rest um, of the tenants in the building, too. Oh, uh, I didn't realize she killed them all. Because when you because you see her running through the building and they pan outside and you literally see the windows on all the build like on all the apartment buildings just blow out and there's fire and you see her lightning bolts as well. Oh, I missed that. Yeah. Okay. Well, there you go. I well, the reason they did that is because they were trying to frame Kenji for it. Yeah. Uh, so that way they can still have a super villain for the seven to fight. Um. So it was a calculated move by Vought and Stormfront. But yeah, I think you're right. I think um, it was very jarring and hard to watch. I think a lot of the show is about that. And yeah, I mean, I think it was extremely effective in the way that they did it. Um, And I think it's probably trying to make us feel this way. It's trying to set up this character to be a villain, like a a bad villain going forward, in my opinion. And they, they certainly took an approach to doing that. And yeah, I mean, it was hard to watch. 
It's also even harder to watch when they have a news conference where the refugees from that apartment building are like basically taking shelter and getting aid. Yeah. And Stormfront is given like the microphone basically and she says, You know who the real the real heroes are? The people behind us. And that moment I think makes her like even seem even more evil to me. Like it just makes her you can tell that she's willing to be just as bad as Homelander and she can turn on the public face just as easily as he can, but then also be a maniac behind the scenes just like him. Well, and he sees that too. Because yeah. he is not happy because he wants to be that person. He wants to be the spokesperson. He wants to be the one in charge of basically killing terrorists and framing them for this kind of stuff, because that was what he was used to doing. So it's certainly going to be interesting where their relationship goes, because I think you're right. I think somehow Vought is trying to get her to be the new face of the Seven in some sense. So so Butcher steps in to save Huey from Homelander when they get captured oh, yeah. in the tunnels. So Homelander now knows that Butcher is back. Because it kind of seems like, they're not very clear, but it almost seems like Homelander implies that the only reason Butcher is alive is because Becca and him made a deal that he gets to see his son and Butcher can live. But now that Homelander knows Butcher is back, I'm wonder I'm wondering how that's going to impact his relationship with Becca and his son. Me too. I guess I didn't catch that because, I mean, my immediate thought would be Homelander doesn't seem like one that really care to make that kind of deal when he could just force himself into his son's life. So yeah, that's interesting. Certainly Butcher returning and not only returning, but returning to the being the leader of the boys in some degree is going to be interesting going forward and kind of their relationship we saw towards the end of season one, I think it's probably going to resume from this point on, or at least I hope so. I want to see them interact more. So that's something I'm looking forward to. What are you looking forward to the rest of the season? I don't really have anything that I'm looking forward to, but I do have something I want to see more of. I really hope uh, mm-hmm. Maeve gets more of a spotlight in this uh, season because she's one of my favorite characters. And I think she's really interesting. Um, I think we are eventually headed for a showdown between her and Homelander because even in season one, she wasn't on board with a whole lot of the Vought stuff and a lot of the stuff Homelander does, but she feels trapped for her girlfriend. Um, so I, yeah. I hope, I hope we, I really hope they spend more time with her in the, in the future episodes. Cause I think she's a super interesting character. Yeah. She did not have a lot of screen time here. Really her only role so far in the show in season two is they do establish that she still cares for this woman. And the reason that she kind of left initially is because she believes that if Homelander finds out about this, you know, ex-girlfriend, um, but still someone she cares deeply about that he would kill her. And we do get kind of a hint of that whenever she's talking with Homelander later. Um, so it kind of kind of gives more background to Maeve, which was nice. But I do hope we get more screen time for her. Also, um, opening scene was Black Noir. I thought we were getting set up to see more of this character. But I'm starting to think at this point, maybe he's just going to kind of be a background character. I don't really care. I mean, obviously, these are all terrible people. But I thought it was interesting that he is the focus of the opening action sequence of the show. We don't really see much from him except him crying in the hallway whenever Compound V is revealed <laughs> to yeah. the public. Um, and cool the opening sequence, I'm, though. Yeah, very effective. Um, and then the only other thing that I'm really looking forward to, at least so far, based on the information we know, is I'm really curious where the whole Starlight and A-Train relationship is going to go. A-Train obviously comes out of his coma from season one that he was put into by Starlight. And they basically come up, come to this deal where... A-Train can now not reveal that Starlight has Compound V, and she will not reveal that he killed his girlfriend in Season 1. So that's kind of their current deal, but obviously those terms could change over the next few episodes. Will A-Train expose Starlight to the rest of the Seven? Will Starlight expose A-Train to the world for his the murder he committed? That's kind of one of the main things I'm interested in, just because I really liked those scenes they had together, because obviously they were trying to hold back, but also by the end of the that kind of little mini storyline, they really kind of had to make this deal and accept it. And I thought it was pretty, I thought they were good scenes. That's interesting, because I kind of felt like his story was done in season one. And I, I do kind of wish that the scenes that were allocated to him in these first three episodes were instead allocated to Maeve. Hmm. Yeah. I, okay. Yeah. I agree with that. I, I I wish she would have gotten more screen time than A Train. I definitely agree with that. I the only reason I really liked A Train was seeing him with Starlight. So to your point, 
if he's not if he like if he's in scenes without like kind of that interplay, I'm not sure if I'm really going to be interested because we got so much of him last season. So yeah, I think that's something to kind of keep out for over the course of the season. We'll see what they do with him. So I gave you my um, overall impressions of this of these first three episodes at the beginning. Why don't you give me your overall impressions of these first three seasons as we wrap up here? Yeah, man, I thought it was good. I thought it was entertaining. Um, did I feel as like connected to it by the end of season one when I was watching that? No, I'm not hooked, like hooked, hooked yet. I'm glad that the boys are back. I'm glad the show is back. And I'm really curious to see where the next two episodes go. But I think ultimately I do agree with you. I really felt the most into the show, probably like the last 20 minutes of the third episode. Yeah. One and two just felt like a lot like set up. There was some good stuff in there. The Maeve relationship stuff was a highlight for sure. Starlight is always a highlight. Anything with Homelander, seeing him interact with his son was a highlight, especially by the end whenever his son basically rebuffs him using his powers. So there's lots of great individual scenes, but just the fact that it was basically like three hours worth of content, I think most of it was kind of throwaway for me. And I was surprised that most of the stuff that I didn't love was actually the boys' stuff. I was more interested by... Some of the stuff we got to see with the Seven, kind of the politics, Giancarlo Esposito, how he fit into his new role. Um, so I'm hoping we get more good stuff with the boys. So yeah, that's I think that's a good take. Here. I th- I think if Butcher and Huey weren't fighting, I think the boys stuff would have been more interesting. I just wish that they were more, like, where we leave off in season one, like, it, it feels like Huey's about to get on board. So I just kind of wish we were there at the start of season two. You know what I mean? Yeah. And another thing, I'm cur- I thought we were going to get it in the first episode, actually, but there was a big announcement semi-recently that Sean Ashmore um, from the X-Men film series, um, from Man of Medan, the game, kind of just an actor that people would recognize you looking up, but he, he played Iceman in the X-Men movies. Um, they announced that he is playing Lamplighter in The Boys Season 2, who was the character that Starlight replaced in the beginning of Season 1. So that was a kind of like a big announcement that they had. And I'm really curious what role he would play. I never thought anything of it in season one. Whenever they had like that character like retire, we never saw him, but he like retired and then Starlight came in. So now to have like a pretty well-known actor playing that role, I'm, I'm curious what, you know, that how that might play in. Um, I haven't read the comics, so I don't know. But I just thought it was interesting that a pretty well-known actor was cast as a character that we heard so much about in the first season, but never saw. So I'm curious how that will play into the season as well. Yeah. I'm, I'm super excited for the rest of the season for sure. Um, and lucky for all our listeners, since they're doing it weekly, you get five more weeks or whatever of these bonus episodes as well. Yeah. And I think I'm excited to actually, not only to watch the show, but I'm excited to do the episodes. Cause like I said, this one was a bit tougher because we're trying to balance all like all these storylines like fitting like into three hours worth of content so I'm, I'm excited to actually record these episodes because we'll be able to kind of just kind of break down and digest one episode one hour and we can talk about the story in full i think it'll be a bit easier so i'm excited to do that as well yeah so i think i think we could probably sum up these three episodes with a little bit underwhelming but a great cliffhanger for the for the forthcoming episodes yeah, it's exciting stuff. I'm happy to be doing this. Um, like you mentioned at the outset, Keith had not actually seen The Boys, but he is working his way through it. So whenever he gets caught up, he's going to join these bonus episodes as well. So we're really excited about that. A little bit of scheduling for you, I guess. We're hoping to put these boys' bonus episodes out on Thursdays. And as always, we'll keep our main episodes coming out on Tuesdays. Um, so as for as long as this season runs, um, you should be getting this bonus episode every Thursday coming to your earbud. Awesome stuff. And then I believe the episodes themselves are coming out on Friday. So it's kind of perfect timing in that sense. All right. Well, I think that's going to do it for us. So thank you guys so much for listening. Um, as always, if you wouldn't mind, please sharing us with a friend if you enjoyed this episode. Um, at the Arnie's is our social and the Arnie's.media is the website. And we'll be back on Tuesday with our main episode. We've got another debate episode coming to you. We're going to be debating the best movie scores. That's right, guys. So we're excited to do that. In the meantime, go ahead, send us a DM over on Instagram at the Arnie's. Um, like our content, comment, share if you send us a dm with your thoughts on the boys or any of the other episodes we have upcoming we'll be happy to read them live on the show all right everybody so i hope you enjoyed our podcast within a podcast the boys talking the boys we'll be back next thursday with another episode breaking down episode four in the meantime 
more Arnie content coming your way soon. So thanks for listening. We'll see you next time. Bye, everyone. The boys are back in town. (laughs) 